Jeff McGinnis, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you. Thank you for having me on. Man, it's going to be fun. I love this era <clears throat> that you were a part of. Let's start with the goods. When was the first time you heard Coach Gables pulling you out of red shirt? Oh, geez. Um, it was fairly, I want to say it was probably four or five weeks into the season, I think. You know, so we had already been pretty well into um, the academic calendar. I had wrestled at a few opens. Um, you know, the team was doing okay, but they weren't performing at optimal level. And then we had um, somebody on the team became ineligible. And so looking at where we lined up um, as a team, you know, Gable was never one to say, hey, let's take the year off and rebuild. It's not a rebuilding year. There's no such thing <laughs> uh, for him. And so he came to me and said, hey, you know, both Joe Williams and myself were a true freshman and said, we think we think you're both ready to wrestle. Um, you know, it's up to you, but we want you to make the decision to compete for us. And when, you know, when Dan Cable comes calling, you certainly don't say no very often. And let's not forget that the year before Coach Gable – had went out on a limb and pulled Lincoln from red shirt, you know, caused the, I call it the Steiner shuffle. I'm sure people caught a number of things, but crazy decision. And, you know, pull Lincoln out of red shirt. It works out well. The team wins. And then the year you're talking about, I forgot about Joe Williams. His first dual meet was at Gallagher against Pat Smith. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say I confronted coach Gable, but I think about two years ago, we were having an alumni reunion. I was sitting there talking to Mike Euclid and a few other people. And it just came to my mind. I'm like, I, I've always wondered what he was thinking with like, Hey, let's, let's not only pull Joe's red shirt, but have him wrestle against Pat Smith at Oklahoma state in Pat Smith's senior year. And, and Gable senior kind of, night. <laughs> yeah. Gable chuckled about it. And said, you know, I didn't necessarily calculate that the best way possible. Um, and you know, would have maybe done it differently. Um, but you know, it's one of those things that he was never willing to not, I mean, again, he, it was, it was something like, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Um, you know, I was lucky enough that, Hey, let's, let's bring Jeff outright. I think my dual first duel was either against Minnesota or Lehigh. Um, I could have wrestled my first duel against Penn state, which was Sanchero Abe, mm -hmm. who, who I, I think lost three times that year and then beat three times the following year. And so it, it, it you know, as, as a very, very young, um, college freshman, you know, I was barely, I was just 18. Um, it was, it was, it was a challenge, you know, it's not something that I was, I was prepared for mentally or physically, I had always assumed that, hey, I'm in a red shirt and have a chance to get ready for next year. And so do you think this was like after Christmas or before Christmas when you got the call? I have to go back and look. I want to say I'd have to go back and look when the semester ended. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to say it was like around Thanksgiving time after first first quarter, first quarter, first semester um, ended because, you know, we had some things happen with guys on the team and it didn't work out. Um, and, and I know they did a signer shuffle the previous year. I mean, we had they had to shuffle weights for us when Joe came out because um, Daryl Weber was at 158. Um, Lincoln was at 150. And so the only way for Daryl to stay in the lineup was for him to cut to 42. And so that was, I mean, it was a monstrous cut. I, to, this, to this day, I don't know how he did it. Um, I remember watching him at nationals make weight. Um, you know, the challenges of, of that cut were monstrous, but you know, he was an incredibly disciplined person, incredibly giving, you know, of himself to be able to do that for the team. Yeah, I've had Daryl on, on this podcast before, and he talks about, like, man, in the national finals, I believe, right? At what, so at one point, did he end up uh, winning it? He won it. So he wrestled Mark – he beat Mark Branch, I think, the following year um, he went up. Um, That's right. Lincoln might have redshirted that year, and he either went to 50 or 58, and Joe went to six. I can't remember exactly how that played out. Yeah. Uh, but he was wrestling Mark Branch and, you know, was in on him deep, and then Mark, Mark I think, tore his knee in the match. That's or right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. So, man, but you talk about a guy who, you know, that good to be in the NCAA finals and win it, but he's third fiddle to Joe and Lincoln. Like that is just such yeah. a tough weight to be in and no disrespect. I mean, it's just like, man, look at those legends though. And he had to bounce around with those guys. Yeah. And he, you know, I mean, he was one of those, he was one of the guys that came in and, and, and just was a workhorse, you know, Daryl, Daryl was, Daryl was, he came in every single day, worked, worked his ass off, knew that, you know, for him to be on the team, he would maybe have to bounce around a bit. Um, I don't think he assumed that again, that they were going to pull Joe out um, and they had a tryout and Joe won. And then, you know, the, the response was, all right, where can I, where can I wrestle on the team? And, you know, it was 42. Um, they moved Hogan up from 126 was there before to 134 to fill Bill Zadek spot. And then um, uh, Lincoln was at, at uh, 150. Got it. Okay. Wow. I mean, think about the, uh, that's the kind of just the commitment that 
you know, the guys had for Gable back then. Like he, he asked for a, a change and the guys are making it happen. And so you come out <clears throat> uh, of red shirt. And just from what I had read, your high school style wasn't what one would say is maybe like the Hawkeye style. And to correct me if I'm wrong on that, but did you have like pressure conforming to that style or did you feel any pressure conforming to that style or was it kind of do your own thing? Um, You know, I think, I think there's a misconception about how Gable coach and coaches mm -hmm. was that there was, you know, his way or the highway. Um, you know, he wanted people to wrestle hard at the end of the day when back in those days, the Iowa style was kind of what everybody assumed Tom Terry brands. But in reality, if you looked at the team, you know, Tom Ryan, uh, Pfizer, Steiners, they all had their own little nuances. They all wrestled hard, um, but they all just necessarily, they weren't brawlers, um, like sort of everybody assumed the Iowa style was. And what, what made Gable a great coach in many ways was his ability to work with what type of athlete you were. You know, I wasn't somebody that would come into the practice room and wrestle Tom Brands, Terry Brands, Bill Zedek, Lincoln Macri. You know, I couldn't have those weeks. <laughs> those There's names. Guys, yeah, I mean, those, <laughs> those, those, that, I think that was my first week. And I went to him and said, listen, this isn't going to work for me. I need to have days where I, I can have more success, work on rhythm, work on different things. Um, but there were guys that did that, you know, and my style was I wrestled hard, um, you know, and I hand fight. I, I, I was good with ties, but I was also you know, funky and flexible and could scramble well and, and, and very good on top. And so, you know, it was, it was with coach Gable finding ways to take advantage of what worked for me versus what worked for Mike Mena, you know, obviously another non-conventional, if you look at the Iowa style mm -hmm. and Joe Williams, you know, so three guys I would say are definitely not the traditional Iowa style, um, but yet we're able to succeed at the highest level under coach Gable. Yeah, man. And I, you talk about the scrambling, I rewatched the match with you and Mark Ironside that is a fun little scramble there. I think it's like the second or third period. And uh, man, I didn't realize you, you two had got together though. Was that a pretty hyped up match back in the day? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a combination of they, you know, city high and Jefferson were two of the toughest teams in the state at the time, um, especially in the dual side and then NBC, which, you know, historically has been one of the toughest conferences in, in Iowa. And we wanted to win the dual title. We wanted to win the traditional title through the NBC. And we knew that if I moved up, um, the guy that was at 135, Brad Aldean, he could actually go down to 130. And mm. so he could go down to 130, win that match. I could go up and beat Ironside. And so both my junior and senior year moved up to wrestle him in the dual. And then we assumed that same thing. I moved up to 135 at um, at the big dual tournament and they moved Mark to 140. So we didn't wrestle again uh, that year. Got it. But man, just hearing the crowd, it looked like it was at City High based on the video I was watching. It must have been awesome. Yeah, it was it was loud. You know, I was friends with Mark. Um, you know, it wasn't something I was going up because I there was any bad blood. I just, you know, one wanted the team to win and two, I love to compete. And so being able to move up to 135, you know, wrestle against the best in the state um at that weight was was fun. But then, you know, in my junior senior year, I moved up quite a bit. But so mm. my four, my my senior year for super MVCs it was the first year they had the super MVC tournament. I actually wrestled at 140. Um, and again, it was one of those wow. things that looking at the team race, um, you know, so I had Eric Koble who was a state champion. You know, I think I had three or three or four top three or four guys in the state at 140 in the MVC at 140 that year. And you wrestled 126 the next couple of years. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, I was not a big, you know, I wasn't a big 130 pounder. I never cut any weight in high school. The only time I ever cut any weight was usually freestyle during the summer. So like mm -hmm. my freshman year, I placed Fargo at one at 98 pounds. I was a 103 pounder, um, one at 114 when I was a 112 pounder. Um, and then I know my my junior senior year, I, I don't think I cut any weight for Fargo. I think I was pretty much right at the weights that I wrestled. And how did you do those years at Fargo? I uh, third and second or second and third. Um, the, after my junior year, I got second. I got beat by Danny Felix, um, mm -hmm. post match, um, after I won junior worlds that summer. And then, uh, my senior year, I got beat in the semis in a match that maybe shouldn't, maybe wasn't scored correctly, but that's another conversation. <laughs> And for folks who aren't from Iowa, you know, Jeff McGinnis, one of the few undefeated four-time state champs, maybe the fourth or fifth to ever do that. And so we're talking, uh, we're talking about a name that I'm sure when you showed up to Fargo, you had a bullseye on your back just being from the great state of Iowa. Um, and obviously you grow up in Iowa city, you know, city high is one of the great programs, uh, at that time, at least Geneseo, where I went to high school, used to have a tournament called the by state. 
were you guys going to that Geneseo by state at that time? Uh, we went there my junior and senior year. So when, so my, my coach, my first two years was uh, coach Clyde Bean who coached my dad, uh, my dad, and my uncle. And so he'd been around for a long time. And then he retired after, you know, I won my second state tournament. Something I, I respect to this day was, you know, he brought me in and said, Hey, I'd always plan on retiring and it's not like I'm asking your permission, but I want to make sure that, you know, you're okay with it. You know, you know, he could have coached two more years and likely had a four, fourth state title, four, a four times ch- uh, titleist. Um, and then coach Brad Smith came in legendary coach from Lisbon was yeah. at Iowa city, went back to Lisbon. And so he kind of started looking at taking us to some more challenging regional tournaments. Geneseo was one of them. You had Providence, New Lenox, you had Mount Carmel, you had Geneseo, you had Dixon. I mean, there was, I mean, it was, Jacob and Micah Hay were at Dixon. Um, the Williams brothers were at Mount Carmel. Garrett and a bunch of other guys that went on to wrestle at Illinois were at Providence New Lenox. So you had some really tough non-private schools in Illinois. You also had, the, I think, top three or four private schools mm-hmm. in Illinois at that tournament. Yeah, I know. Mount, we just did a, a an audio documentary on Tony Davis, who was at Mount Carmel in that era. And he, you know, he was kind of in and out of the lineup. But, of course, the stalwarts were Joe and TJ. And you, uh, you know, you wrestle with Joe and I believe you're a roommate with him, but you know, what, did he have a little bit of a reputation even back in high school going to that tournament? Um, you know, we were, by that time we were both on the national stage. You know, we had, I'd won junior nationals my sophomore year beat Scott Schluter, who was going for his fourth. Um, and then he had played super high and was doing some amazing things Um, him, his brother, Steve, who was older, um, who passed away. You know, Steve was Steve was the one that was super electric. Joe is, you know, Joe is Joe. Um, mm-hmm. you know, sort of that just easy peasy and then lightning double leg before when you were kind of kind of halfway asleep. But he was definitely an amazing wrestler back then. You know, physically something that he did he does he did, he does and did things that that to this day boggle my mind. He was Jordan Burroughs before Jordan Burroughs was that guy. So that's so crazy you say that. I believe Kevin Jackson was on and said that same thing. And he, you know, because he was with him at Colorado Springs at that time, but yeah, I mean, and you think about Joe, after he won four, he wrestled Lincoln at the Esparo trials, I believe. Mm-hmm. And Lincoln had already been in Iowa for a year, and he beat Lincoln when it's like, whoa. I mean, because McRave, he also one of the greats. Yep, yep. And I think that was, so that was junior world team trial. trial okay. Uh, at Evanston, Illinois, uh, that they wrestled. That was the so the trials for the junior worlds my junior year. And I don't know if Lincoln, Lincoln, I don't know if Lincoln had been at Iowa yet. A year, yeah, I think Lincoln was just gradu- graduating. So senior. he had just signed. Okay. Yeah, he was a graduating senior. So, it, and and Joe didn't end up going on the world team with us that year. Lincoln went with us, but, you know, we had Kerry McCoy. We had myself. We had, um, God, who was our, uh, uh, Slay was on that team. Um, we had, uh, God, who was the one I'm thinking of? I'll, I'll think of it in a second. But it was, you know, again, you look at some of the junior world teams now that you have. Um, you know, it was who's who of the college scene during that same generation. Yeah. So did Joe beat Lincoln at that tournament then? Am I remembering that that piece right? I know they wrestled. I can't remember if Joe beat him or not. Yeah. I, it, yeah. I mean, I've watched, you know, between them, them in comp- actual competition. I mean, some of the f- best times in my life with wrestling was an Iowa practice where Joe and Lincoln decide to wrestle each other and then half nobody else gets anything done because we're just <laughs> we stopped wrestling and watch oh the, my god the, the, the firepower that both of them had the scrambling ability i mean they'd go they'd get in scrambles that and do things that you know again you know physically that nobody else could do you know joe's firepower is explosiveness and lincoln's ability to scramble out of things and it was some fun wrestling to watch man i get chills thinking about those two guys going at it man it's like unbelievable yeah I mean, and we had we had some amazing top to bottom i mean you look you look at kind of the firepower that Tom and Terry are building now. And, you know, as a, as a division three coach, I get a little bit sometimes upset that I'm like, there's some kids there that could do some amazing things on my, on, on yes. for Simpson. And, you know, are they going to, are some of these kids actually going to see the light of day at Iowa? But, you know, you go back and look at, you know, you had Mike Mena, you had Jesse Whitmer, who's a three-time state champ and it'd be a national title. He was behind um, Mike for three years. You know, behind me, we had uh, Eric Elon, who was, I think, a three-time state champion from Belle Plaine. You had Joe and Corey Stan- – uh, not Joe, Joe and uh, Justin and Corey Stanley, who are multiple-time state champions. Up and down the lineup, you had incredible depth. And so every single practice – there were there really wasn't a lot – I joke and say, I can't wrestle Tom Terry Brands. I need a quote-unquote easy practice. There wasn't a lot of easy practices, no matter who you're wrestling in that room. Right. I mean, and, and you're talking – 
you were there, you know, before 1996. So both Tom and Terry are going full steam, and so they're at their their pinnacle. Yeah. Were you a part of those workouts as well, or like how did they do that back then with the Hawkeye Wrestling Club? Um, they were still wrestling daily. I mean, they were still training because they were still working to make uh, world Olympic teams. Um, Tom, Tom was a beast for me to wrestle. Not that Terry wasn't, I think just the size difference was immense. Um, you know, both of them were ungodly big and strong for their weight. They live incredibly disciplined lifestyles. Um, you know, very little body fat. And so when you're grabbing a hold of them and they have 3% body fat, there's not a lot of waste as far as horsepower goes. <laughs> oh my um, God. But, and then, and then working, you know, there was a period of time when Terry was, you know, trying to make world teams when it was Kendall Cross was his biggest competition. And naturally they look, okay, who, who in the room can wrestle and wrestle most like Kendall. Now, nobody can wrestle like Kendall, but you know, I did a lot of things similar to him with flexibility and balance and inside yeah. trips and throws. And so I would, I would find myself wrestling Terry um, and focusing on trying to be exact to that standard. Man, it's so crazy. You say that because I just rewatched your fourth state title and first thing you do is hit an inside trip on the guy. And so now you're talking Ken across. I can see it. I mean, so, so you were scrapping with Terry. How would you compare Russell and Tom and Terry outside of the size difference? Um, not, I mean, just the strength difference is big. You mm -hmm. see, they're only one weight class apart, but Tom was, Tom was so much stronger and harder for me to wrestle than Terry. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that was just the size aspect of it. They didn't really do anything differently. Um, I think, I think Tom had a better sweep single, you know, than, than Terry did. Um, Terry shot a little bit better um, elbow, elbow pass, elbow push double to the far side. Um, so it was more of an adjustment and figuring different things out. They didn't wrestle identical, but there was things that each of them did differently. And were you there when Alan Freed was training at Iowa City as well? Uh, he was there during the 2000 cycle. So I was, that was the same year that myself. So we had Alan Freed, um, Bill Zadick, Mark Ironside, myself all training for the same spot for the 2000 Olympics. I love the smile you cracked when I mentioned Alan Freed. I love that guy. I've, uh, He's just so fun to talk to. Now I have to ask, is the legendary Bill Zadig fight, is that myth or is that, is that truth? When him and I, Freed got into it at the, at the uh, locker room in the plastics. I don't remember it. I mean, I've heard <laughs> stories about it. I wasn't there. I mean, keep in mind, I graduated 98. Um, I was in law school. And so while I was trying to make a world team, I was in my second year of law school. I'd won, I had wrestled in the Dave Schultz, the Colorado tournament. I won Dave Schultz. I beat um, uh, Eric Enzerud from Oregon, um, uh, Ehrman, um, who coached uh, Cox. And then in the finals, I beat uh, TJ Jaworski. Mm -hmm. And so I'd, I'd won that tournament. And I think I was ranked going into, seeded going into the U.S. Nationals, I think top four maybe. But, you know, I was, I was in law school and the time commitment of that, trying to balance was, was somewhat of a limiting factor. And didn't place at U.S. Nationals, had a chance to still, I was still qualified for world team trials because I'd won the Dave Schultz, but decided um, I took the money and ran a little yeah. bit, so to speak. <laughs> I, I, got, I got offered a pretty pretty good uh, job offer to go work at a big firm in Chicago. And at that time, they were throwing around crazy, crazy dollar figures for, you know, people that were in the top part of their law school class. Yeah. And I, I do know that, uh, you know, a buddy of mine, a lawyer here at a big firm and like some of the hours that he was working early on absolutely insane was that a kind of was that the kind of place where you're working like 78 hour work weeks right from the get-go yeah yes and no i mean we were you know the firm was about 500 attorneys we were litigation focused we had a corporate department as well i was doing environmental and pharmaceutical defense litigation so it ebbed and flowed you know if we were preparing for a trial or appeal um yeah it was certainly long hours um i spent you know what kind of did me in with with deciding to move back to Iowa, I spent, I think, two or three months straight in Oxford, Mississippi, um, which beautiful. I mean, I mean, you wouldn't want a better place as far as to hang out and stay, but it was, I think, three weeks or two weeks after one of my, ch my children were born. Oof. And so, and it was going to be more of that. It was going to be more of the same because I was quickly, um, you know, climbing that ladder, was in track to make partner, um, junior partner pretty quickly and got recruited to move back to Iowa to work at a law firm there. And it just made sense because, you know, me being from Iowa city, my wife being from Cedar Rapids, you know, I just want to be better connected to my children's growth. Yeah, no, I can imagine that's, that's a tough life. And that, that climb is, is brutal. And uh, wrestling probably suited you well for that. 
if we go back to the wrestling, we've glossed over so many fun topics. We have to, I just got to follow the timeline a little bit. So <clears throat> let's go back to the 93, 94 season. You get pulled out of red shirt, Oklahoma state's on a, on an absolute terror that year. And you know, they're, they're on track to, to win their first after being suspended. You guys go to Oklahoma state, you know, Joe gets, gets tacked by Pat Smith. Did you wrestle in that one? Or I you- did. I wrestled Perler. Um, and I, I got ahead of him, and then and then I can't room. I mean, I ended up losing the match in a close, like either one or two point match. Yeah. Um, with you know, with wrestling, wrestling against their referee as well. Yeah, and uh, and that's that's a guy who at that national tournament, you know, Perler was right up there and, and could have won it. He he loses early, and Mark Branch steps up, unseated, losing mm-hmm. record, and gets the gets it done. W- what was your first you know first memories of of going to the NCAA tournament as a true freshman? Well, I came back and beat Perler at nationals. Um, and so um, I, I can't remember it either was in the consolations or for the placing matches. So I came back and wrestled in and beat him. Um, you know, I think I, I grew up around it. You know, I mean, our, our spring breaks, you know, most people went to Disneyland or maybe skiing. Our spring breaks were going to the NCAA tournament. My dad was super close to our wrestling program, treasurer of the Hawkeye Wrestling Club. And so it was a natural thing for me. Um, it was you know, I wouldn't say it was just another tournament, but it wasn't as um, crazy awe inspiring as you'd think it would be. Um, I, that being said, again, I don't know. I don't know mentally if I was in the right spot yet. Um, How do you mean? You know, it just, you know, Gable always tells everybody, and I think coaches probably say the same thing now. Every kid comes in and says, you never know what's going to happen. You need to be ready. You might be the guy that, that we need to step up. And, and certainly he was telling Joe and I that message, but yet, I didn't, I wouldn't say I took it true to heart. Um, I wasn't doing everything that I could have done um, that first year to put myself in the best possible situation to compete. Um, Not that it would have changed anything, but I certainly would have felt better about how I competed that year. Not that I wrestled horribly. I think I lost like three, four matches all year, ended up fifth. Um, But the guy that I lost to, I I didn't wrestle the smartest match. Uh, Who knows? Right, right. So after this, um, you you come back the next year, undefeated national champ, and you you flip the script on Abe. What was it like wrestling since you were in all those bouts? I mean, six times in two years, pretty crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, we had uh, between him and then the other one that I had a lot of battles with was Dwight Henson from Iowa State. Um, and Dwight was Dwight was always sort of that guy that was right there. Um. And ironically, I didn't get nervous wrestling Centuro in the finals. I had I had an emotional breakdown um, before the semifinal match with Dwight because I knew I knew just what? as far as wrestling him, you know, I, I had a sports psychologist that I worked with, and I knew I just knew that you know you, you win the match in the finals, it's easy to get up for the finals, it's not a challenge. If you lose that semifinal match, now you now now you got to battle back. Now it's hard because I had done that the year before. I'd lost a match that I thought I should could have won, and and I knew. Um, you know, I, I, Dwight, Dwight was stronger than I was and he was a better athlete. Than I, was. I had to wrestle smarter. Um, I had to be a smarter wrestler. And I, a lot of the matches, a lot of the matches, that wasn't the case where I thought I was always the smarter, more physical and the better wrestler. Um, with him, I knew that he had some things that I had to be very careful about. I mean, I'd wrestled him. I think I wrestled him like seven, eight times, never beat him by more than two points. Right? And so, um, it was one of those things that, that getting up for that match was more important than the finals. Wrestling Abe was always um, a little bit of a game plan too, because he was clearly better than I was on my feet. Right. No doubt. But I also knew I went into every match up one zero because I could ride him. He couldn't ride me. In fact, he, I don't think he took down on me. Right. It's one of those things. So I'm automatically up every match one zero. Yeah. And when you have that mentality, okay, now I can give up a takedown and not worry about it versus him. If he gives up a takedown and I ride him out, that's, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, and you were a, it's a hellacious writer and, and that shows in a lot of the matches going back to the Dwight Henson match. So that was a Friday night semifinal. Yep. So when did you have a, have like a moment of crisis where you had to, had to kind of get your senses together like this, like in the hotel or in the tunnel? Uh, in the hotel. So we were staying at the Canterbury Inn um, out off of the Corville strip. Um, so if you kind of like now where the new um, wrestling places that they all hold yeah. the events, the extreme center, just out that way. And it was after so I'd won, I'd won the quarterfinal match. It was in between the two. And I knew, I wouldn't say I had a complete breakdown, but I knew I was having some emotional challenges. And so I'd called 
called the guy that I deal with, uh, Maury Adams, who was my sports psychologist at the time, had him come in, do some hypnosis, and just just relax me because I was just getting too too hyped up about it, too worried about it, which was out of character for me. You know, I, I, I knew enough to recognize quickly that that was well out of character to how my mind operated and where I needed to be uh, for optimal optimal performance. And so I brought him in and, and just worked through and talked about why I was nervous, right? Um, and why I was scared about what could happen and what might not happen and, you know, ended up being okay. It's pretty cool that you were working with a sports psychologist back in the, uh, you know, the early to mid nineties. Was that yeah. common on the team or is it something you had done your whole life? Uh, something I started doing, I think after my freshman, sophomore year um, in high school, uh, Maury was a longtime family friend, also somebody that was involved with the IRS wrestling program and had a background in that and, and knew, I think a little bit of the pressures that were going to be put on me. Um, by being a local Iowa City guy after I'd won my first or second state title, it's not like, hey, congratulations, it's like, great, when are you going to win your next one, right? Or right. How you, you know, there's there's no time to sort of celebrate accomplishments um, when you're that guy, especially when you're at Iowa. Like, so same thing after I won my sophomore year, it wasn't like, hey, congratulations, now you can relax. It's like, now you got to get ready and win two more, right? It was, <laughs> you, win, you win one at Iowa, it's sort of average, you win two, you're slightly above average, you win three, it's like, hey, now you're good. Yeah. And so you were feeling those pressures big time going into your senior year? Uh, my sophomore year or my junior so, year. My junior, junior year. year. Yeah. Uh, sophomore year, a little bit. The sophomore year, you know, I was able to relax, have fun with wrestling, focus on myself. My junior year was was a miserable experience in many ways, um, just for me in the sport. And then I redshirted in between my junior and senior year, uh, moved up to 142 my, my last year and actually loved the sport again. And, you know, it was, I, I was in wrestling for the sake of wrestling, not to please, you know, people other than myself. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, you know, 1997, one of the most insane years ever with coach Gable and a lot of people who know wrestling know you didn't wrestle that year. Cause as you mentioned, you redshirted. So there's a national champ on the bench and I'm sure you had multiple goes with Mena and, and knew where you stood there. So let's go back to your know, freshman year, get pulled, take fifth, sophomore year, undefeated national champ unbelievable when did the weight start becoming an issue for you it was a little bit of an issue my sophomore year you know i you don't you don't get smaller as you get older i mean i can certainly <laughs> say, that, say that now i mean right. I, people are like what do you weigh i'm like i you don't want to know what i weigh <laughs> um, so you know it was i managed it well my sophomore year i did i did everything right in my sophomore year by way of managing weight and doing everything else um my junior year i never quite got to where I needed to be weight wise, I would say, um, you know, even early in the season had, had, you know, so I come back off of a tough, uh, uh winning nationals. I try out against Eric Elon. You know, I, I'd come from behind in the tryout in against Iowa to, to literally beat Eric. Um, and I think, you know, but for him probably making a mistake in the match and giving me some dumb points, he would have beat me in the tryout. This uh, is your it, junior it, year after the I, defending I, national I, champ. Yeah, my junior year. And so, you know, I did, I wasn't wrestling where I needed to be. I wasn't doing the small things correctly. Um, never got quite, quite got my weight down. And then we roll into midseason and we go to Midlands. Midlands is, you know, arguably the toughest tournament of the year outside of Big Tens and Nationals. It's sort of the, the mid year measuring stick of where you are, where everybody else is, where the team is. And so, um, and it's always right after the holidays. It's the worst timing possible. And I think I went in, I think it was 16 and a half pounds over a day and a half before. Um, Ooh. You know, Struggled to make weight. Um, in fact, took my plastics off, went to check weight and was still over, I think, two, three pounds. And they're like, get yourself back on, get yourself back on. I'm like, slow down. I need to chill for a second. You know, they're like, you're going to lose your sweat. They're all worried about it that I was going to not make weight. Well, actually go back, go, go before that. I didn't make weight for the first duel. The first duel, we were traveling to South Dakota to wrestle Mitchellville and then to Billings, Montana. Um, I flaked out. I disappeared. Like I knew, like I didn't make weight. I did. I disappeared. I went and hid somewhere. I had heard the Barry Davis story. Um, yes. I, I, I had known that and how, and how he got found. I'm like, I'm not going to be found. This isn't going to happen. And so I went and hid. Um, did you make the trip or didn't even oh, make the trip? No, I got sent. So I got sent to wrestle uh, 134 at, I think the up at Wisconsin, the when Madison still had their open. And the so Northern open. Um, so early on, I knew, I knew there was going to be some challenges, um, but got to Midlands, made weight. 16 and a half pounds in a day and a half, um, 10 pounds over to make it for the, so the second day you have to make weight second day with an allowance. I think I was 10 pounds over after, um, the session ended pin tech, 
pinned and tech followed my way through the tournament. The number, the guys who ended up number three, four, and five at nationals that year, pinned and tech fall, not even close. I mean, what? even the guys I pinned, I like destroy. So I, of course, being a stupid college student, I'm like, oh, I can cut a lot of weight and do really well. In fact, I can do better if I cut my weight. Um, and so despite coaches telling me, you're not a weight cutter, you're not this guy, you need to get your weight down. It's going to wear on you throughout the year. I never did. And so instead of practices being fun, wrestling being fun and practices being about getting better at wrestling, practices became how much weight can I lose? What do I weigh before? What do I weigh after? I, I, did, I could care less whether I was getting better at wrestling. All it was was weight management practice. Um, how miserable was that Big Ten grind that season? Just it was getting bad. through it was, that. It was bad. And then I didn't make weight. So I didn't make weight again the second day. So I'd lost one of the few. <sighs> I was, I was one of those persons like, okay, where is somebody the best? I want to try to wrestle in there. So like as a freshman, I wrestled Mark Hall, right? Multiple time world team member Greco uh, as a true freshman. First thing I do is I go up a body. Right <laughs> when I get tossed on my head twice, came back, lost 13, 12. And so my junior year, I was wrestling uh, Crawford, who was a four time state champ from Pennsylvania, probably like six foot one, six foot two. Um, mediocre at best on his feet, but you don't want to let him on top of you. And so I took him down three, four times, second period, my choice, look over. My dad's like, I, I didn't look at my dad. My dad had told me, he's like, you don't go down. Look, the coach, coaches go neutral. And I'm like, I'm going down. I'm going to get out. I'm going to show you that's wrong. <laughs> Got cradled, um, lost the match, didn't make weight. Um, and then big tens um, sprained my ankle in the semifinals. And so I didn't, I medical defaulted in the finals against Sanchero Abe uh, that year. I'd only lost two, three matches all year, two matches, I think all year. Um, but between big tens and nationals, um, I didn't have practices to lose weight. You know, I couldn't wrestle. I couldn't run. I couldn't bite. You know, I had a pretty bad sprained ankle. And so I just, I starved myself. I starved myself to make weight, made weight at nationals, tried to rehydrate, tried to put food back in and my body just wouldn't take it. And so wrestled my first match, one second match, Sean Ford, um, who I had pin tech, uh, tech pinned at in the duel and minute in the match, my legs are complete rubber, right? There's just nothing there. And, and so, I mean, at that point in time, it was just, it was the, the, the train was off the tracks and, you know, I, it just wasn't a good thing. Lost to him, won, a, I think I won a match and then fell to Guerrero. Yeah. Uh, lost a coach match to Guerrero, walked, grabbed my stuff, handed it to my parents and basically told them I'd see him back in Iowa City. Um, realized I didn't have my wallet, went back to the hotel. By the time I get back to the hotel, Royce Alger is there and says, I know you're trying to get out of here, but you're staying with me. And so Royce basically was my quote unquote bodyguard during that period of time, making sure that I was okay, keeping me away, keeping me away from, you know, there's the Iowa fan base is great, but there's some people that aren't great, I would mm -hmm. say, um, yeah. in many ways. And so me being a disappointment to them, right, was an issue. And so just kind of managed me better um, and, and, and was a guy that was always there for me. So did you ever think about not coming back after that for any like, subsequent seasons? No, um, I just knew I wasn't going to wrestle 26 again. Um, you know, Ironside was at 34. And so there was discussions of, you know, Hey, let's do a tryout and figure out, you know, if, if you win 34, Mark goes up or goes down or we figure out the weight, but Gable said, you know, given who we have, I'm going to scoot over here. Cause this son is just, it sounds weird. good. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's that better. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with, with Mark being there and he didn't have a red shirt, um, and we knew that Whitmer, you know, is, and men, men was a huge 18 pounder. And so he, could move up to 26 um whitmer shot in there casey gillis who was um a national top top recruit was at 42 um again I, I think they knew they had a strong team without me i don't think anybody thought that they were going to do what they were going to do certainly nobody picked whitmer to to make it to the finals let alone beat tj moore um is it tj T T T more tj T more sorry T T more yeah Brothers. but even to beat Brothers. morgan from michigan state like he yeah, had never yeah. i mean insane yeah no i mean it was through in that entire line, you know, you had full heart, you had hand. I mean, there was, there was just, they all wrestled better than anybody ever thought they would. Mm -hmm. And as far as teams that I think Gable probably did the absolute best job of peaking, you know, tapering and peaking, getting everybody mentally, physically ready. Um, that's clearly probably his benchmark and, and probably why he went decided that year. Like, Hey, I did it. I did exactly what I wanted to do this year. I'm, I'm done. And um, at so, you and I, like in his hometown, you know, his backyard. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if anybody knew. I mean, um, you know, he certainly didn't tell me and didn't tell anybody else and nobody on the team knew. 
Um, you know, I think it was a decision that maybe he knew all along, but I, honestly, I think after the fact, given what he was able to do with that team and how he got everybody performed, he probably was like, Hey, you know, I achieved exactly what I wanted to achieve. And now I can, I can hand, hand the reins off. Yeah. And he also, and he also knew he had the team, the team that was coming back that he was leaving. Jimmy wasn't going to leave, um, you know, him behind dry. Insane. I mean, just, I mean, the team of the nineties by far, I will won every title of the nineties except one. And so you're, you know, you're at, you're definitely at the UNI nationals that year in 97, you know, you know, you're, you're more than capable of winning it. What are you feeling as you sit there and watch the guys go that year? Um, it was probably, you know, I was super happy for them. Um, it was a little, there's a little bit of, after he retired, I was a little bit hurt, but yet I also knew it wasn't about me. Um, and, and I also knew that was probably the best thing for me was watching and being there. You know, not, not, I was still a part of the team, right? I, every practice, help those guys get ready, compete with them. A lot of their prep work um, leading up to Big Tens and Nationals, they put me in situations on top of people that, you know, hey, ride this, make sure you can try to get out. And so, you know, I was certainly involved. But then for me, um, that was why the biggest, the most, the most amount of progression in my own personal wrestling of any point in time in my life. Because... I was mature enough to now sit and watch wrestling and not just learn about it from a skill standpoint, but learn about the mental aspect of it, the strategic aspect of it and how, you know, in some respects, if you're smart, you can, you can manipulate referees, right. You mm -hmm. know, for shots and mat, just match control. And so knowing how to win um, close matches is an art. It's not just pure luck. And not that I was wanting or planning to have close matches, but just, just, just learning more about wrestling than I'd ever learned in my entire life, being in that age, living through what I did my junior year, being a part of the team, and then coming back my senior year, having that knowledge and watching um, that my junior year was was incredibly important for my progression. And when did you decide that summer that you were going to redshirt that year? Um, I think we got, I think we got all the way through camps. So we did summer camps, and I was weighing, I was getting big. You know, I was hitting the weights pretty big. <laughs> Um, and getting strong. I, I, I don't know if it was until we got all the way back to school that he's like, Hey, you know, let's, let's plan on you redshirting this year. Um, and it was more of a question of like, what do you want to do? I think I hadn't fully healed mentally from what I'd gone through my, my, my junior year. And so uh, a big piece of that was, was probably him seeing that, you know, I, I didn't, I wouldn't say I had the best summer right it wasn't like i came back and was like this will never happen again i'm never going to miss a workout i'm going to go run i'm going to do all these things i had a little bit of a rebellious summer that year mm -hmm. um and and i think he knew that i think he knew that i wasn't ready physically or mentally to to step right back in again yeah that's why he's that's why he's the goat yeah. coach man to see that i mean and you know and but then suggest it and maybe make it seem like it you know that you're agreeing to it when really the whole time he probably knows what he's yeah. gonna do yeah. <laughs> you know he he, pro he probably did i know i know a lot of people wanted to see the fireworks of you know of wrestle off with me and mark um but for him he didn't care right it was like what's best for what's best for you what's best for the team you yeah know? And it just turned out that those two things were kind of in harmony yeah and then when you came back you jumped up two weight classes and you must have been feeling great that year. Um, yeah, I mean, I was weighing so 142, I was weighing maybe 146, 147. Wow. You know, so I was I was not big at all. Um, after practices, I was probably down within a pound or two without and with with full feed. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't a big 42 pounder by any means. Um, and then they had that was the year they had uh two die two two kids die cutting weight. And so they froze everybody's weight class. Um, they moved 142 became 149. That's how we have now have the 149 weight class. So they, everybody gets seven pounds. You can't move weight. So if I was at 42, but I'll, but magically now I can make, you know, 141, they, they wouldn't allow it. Um, oh, and they okay. did, yeah. So you couldn't, you couldn't move weight. So the weight that you've been wrestling as the weight you're forced to stay at, they gave everybody uh, seven pounds and they did one day weigh-ins for nationals. That was so that basically they, they, they didn't have any of the new procedures they have now for monitoring descent, monitoring body fat, monitoring hydration, which, you know, the, the sport has changed dramatically with, with, with the elimination, elimination of weight cutting, right? There's still schools and programs that do it um, and, and, and have found ways around it. But for the most part, the sport, the sport, we still wrestle. 
but since they've taken out that part of it, um, there's things that 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 are drastically different how we go about teaching the sport. So you think there's been a pretty big reduction? I mean, weight cutting is not eliminated at the college level by any means. But do you oh, think no. there's been a pretty big reduction though from like what you saw in the early and mid '90s? Oh God, yeah. Like I pretty mean, it was insane. Yeah, I mean, it was you. You'd come in. You know, Tom Terry Brands cut a lot of weight. Lincoln McAravey cut a lot of weight. It was nothing for them to come in. Well, two things. One, you'd weigh in the the night before. Right. Right. So you had time to rehydrate, you know, so the, the one or two hour weigh-ins limit the ability to do that. And so the, it was nothing for them to come in seven, eight pounds, lose that in an hour weigh in. And then by the time they wrestle, they're 10, 12 pounds over again. So day of weigh-ins, they would feel okay if they were six, seven or no, eight. No, 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 no. I'm talking about pre, this is pre that rule. I'm sorry, but the day of the weigh-in though, like the day of the weigh-in, like if the way, if they're wrestling at five o'clock on Friday, yeah. weigh-ins yeah. on Thursday, what are they coming in at Thursday morning? You think? seven eight nine I, was, I you know i mean I, I if i was if i was within you know if i'm coming in so let's say i'm we're wrestling thursday that thursday evening at seven weigh-ins are eight in the morning right and so or whatever time they are if if i'm coming in six seven pounds myself and i'm not a big weight cutter um you know there it would be nothing for them sometimes to come in eight nine sometimes ten pounds over but i mean lincoln could lose lincoln could lose 10 pounds in an hour in plastics that was nothing for him you know, I couldn't physically do it. My body wouldn't sweat that fast. Um, and more importantly, um, my threshold for pain um, was probably not the same as some of those guys were. I mean, they were real there. Like it, once your body starts getting to a certain temperature, you're going to sweat faster. But my I couldn't get my body to rev that that high without not feeling really bad and wanting to quit. Yeah. I mean, and you think about all this stuff. You know, Gable went through with those teams. You had you're, you're talking about McRae losing weight. I immediately went to all the concussion issues he had that year. So like he's he's kind of in and out, you know. And then Mena, uh, you know, he he had a real scare of weight later at the Big Tens in '97 as well. So man, so yeah, like you said, all those teams, Weber coming down. I mean, that had to be the pull of the century for him to come down. Whatever year it was, you were mentioning earlier, '94, '95. I can't remember. So it was '94. So it was my freshman year at North Carolina. I remember him. You know, him and him, him and Mena struggled the most that year to make weight. Um, you know, I just remember both of them coming within, I think it was the second day lands. I think both of them came within like a minute, maybe of the cutoff of making it. Cause you, you make it, you make it the night before to wrestle the next day. Um, there wasn't an option of like, I can make it at tonight right, or I right. can come in tomorrow. You have to make it the night before with a pound allowance. And a pound allowance isn't that much. I was like, oh, you get a pound allowance. I'm like, whoopity do. That's not right. that much <laughs> when you're cutting that much weight. But I mean, so, you know, I was weighing 146, 147, all of a sudden became 149. And then you look at some of the guys at the weight were, were big already. You know, you had Michael Davids, who was a big 42 pounder. You had Adam Terrell Perley from Illinois, who was a big, and then Cunningham, who became, I think he was a 57 pounder the following year, right? He won it at 157. Yeah. He's who I had in the finals. And I mean, he was, I mean, he was big, right? I, I yeah, he was really big in the finals. I was going to say, I couldn't, I was looking at the bracket from 98 when you went up, man, there was some, uh, Jamar Billman was in there. I mean, yep. tough guy. I'm like, is Casey Cunningham at 142? Oh, that's so crazy. I wrestled Billman. So I, I, we went triple overtime against Billman. It's one of the few YouTube things that are out there. Um, I wrestled him triple overtime at Carver um, and actually tore my MCL. And so I wrestled, I wrestled the back half of that season with a torn MCL. Um, most, of, most of the year I had that a big brace on my leg, um, ankle all the way up to my thigh, and then got to big tens and kind of did a Spencer Lee and took it off and like, I'm not going to wear this because it's limiting my mobility. And so uh, at that point in time, it's like, I only have two more tournaments. If I tear the rest of it, it's not a big deal. Just go with it, man. Yep. Well, there's, I know we're coming down on time and I appreciate you being so flexible. I, I just have a couple of stories we haven't hit on yet that I'd love to love to get your thoughts on. So I came across this one during my research. You and Sergey got together when you were in high school. Yep. How'd that happen? Um, so it was the year, I want to say it was either my sophomore year or my junior year. Um, and so I was, I was on, I was on the radar for USA wrestling, you know, as far as developing, progressing and, in between the national tournament, the sessions, USA would always have a team workout. So um, I, I, one workout I got paired with Corey Bays. And Corey Bays was, was back in the day, they had 105 and a half. He was the starting 118 pounder for Oklahoma State at 118, but he was tiny. Mm -hmm. And I was wrestling, I think, 120. I think it was that was the year I won 
um, junior worlds at 121 maybe. Um, and so I got paired with him, wrestling with him, got in a scramble position, basically a chest lock, faked one way, went the other, um, and, and basically popped his elbow. I mean, he he hyper got hyperextended. He dislocated his elbow. Mm-hmm. And Joe Say, who was the coach for Oklahoma State, as well as the USA guys, like, you're not wrestling any any of your <laughs> USA guys. We're not going to risk this. And I'm like, ah. it wasn't like I did this on purpose. You're a high schooler, for God's sake. Yeah, so I come in I come in the next day. Um, my coach, my, my, my personal coach, who was Keith Moreland, um, says, I got somebody for you to wrestle. And, and I'm like, okay, great. You know, who is it? And I look over and it's this older looking gentleman with like 1960s, 70s looking shoes on. And he's like, he doesn't speak much English, but I think you'll get a good go. And I, I did one, didn't know who Sergei Belgolosov was at the time. And two, certainly didn't know what he had done, who he was, or let alone that that was him. And so we start drilling. Um, you know, I do three, he does three, I do three, he does three. And slowly my three become, I don't finish, he finishes. And that just progresses, it gets pr- harder and harder and harder and harder. And think, oh, we just started going live. Apparently, we're just now live. There was no transition. So I'm like, everything I do, he counters. So I, I do a shot, he counters, go behind. He does this. I mean, it was just, it was horrible. And so we take all, all the things like, all right, break. He goes, now we go live. <laughs> this is just not shaping up to be what I thought it was. <laughs> and so he, you know, he, he does a two-on-one series on me that he does probably 50 variations of a two-on-one series finish. And every time I try something different to counter. So like he gets a two-on-one, I post head, he does something, I grab arm, I grab elbow, I grab... So everything he does, he's got a response for. And we do this, I think we did two or three goes, and I I, I didn't score a single point. I mean, it was, it was bad. And we get done, and finally, Keith is kind of over there smiling, smirking, <laughs> watching. And he tells me who he is, and I'm like, great, still don't know who he is. So he explains to me who Sergey Belaglazov is and that he was like, what, a six, six-time six world champion, couple-time Olympic champion, pretty much in any conversation when it comes to the former Soviet Union, one of the GOATs um, oh, by all, all intents and purposes. Um, fast forward my freshman year at Iowa, he's the invited clinician for our coaches clinic and, and he shows the two-on-one series and I'm watching and I'm like, yep, he did that one on me. Oh yeah. He did that one on me like four or five times. Yeah. <laughs> he did that one too. And so, um, you know, kind of an eye opening experience of the threshold, you know, of where, where you are, you think you're pretty good. You know, you won a few state titles, you've won a junior national champion, you, you've been a junior world champion, and then you just get your shit stomped for lack of a better <laughs> term, um, by him. And it was and it, the, the best part about it. It wasn't like he was beating me up. Like he'd throw me on my, he'd throw me like the biggest throws I've ever been throwing my entire life, but I'd land so soft. It's like, it's like you found a way to throw me and, and score five on me, but yet provide me a pillow as I land somehow. Right. Just Whereas so, if you wrestle the brains, you're getting absolutely beaten yeah. up. So smooth in everything he did. Everything was seamless. And it was just every everything I tried to do, he had a counter a reaction for. Everything that he did that I tried to counter, he had he had the next response for. And you talk to those guys out of Michigan, the Cliff Keen guys. They say if he get, gets on top, he could still do that to a lot of guys with his gut series. Like he's just such a freak that and his technique's so good that the leverage points he creates are just unreal yeah he does a trapped arm gut series out of a leg turf that you know if you go back there's a match where he wrestles brad penrith you know i think it was iowa versus us or usa versus like a world club team and he wrestled brad brad penrith at iowa and again brad was i think had won a national title that year was maybe two or three on the olympic ladder that year and he just it was it was sick to watch what he did to brad yeah. And Brad Penworth went on to, you know, world silver medalist, you know, right in that era. So it's like, yes. geez, yeah. crazy. And he, he, he did that. He, he, you, you, if you go back and watch, he does that. He gets a leg Turk and goes to a far side. And then the next time he tries to do the same thing, Brad po- posts out, he switches, goes the other side. Next time he goes fake lace, he comes up and does like, a, I mean, it, again, it's, it, it, it sort of flashback memories for me as well. <laughs> That's that's crazy. Well, thank you for sharing that. And the, the other thing I was going to ask is, you know, you're around a lot of wrestling. You know, Iowa high school wrestling is at, is at a pinnacle right now. It's, it's looking great. All the academies in the state are, are doing, you know, doing some great things. And, you know, you were a guy that went, you know, in the 90s, high school, four-time undefeated state champ. And I'm curious, what was your, like, your AAU career like? Or, like, how did you um kind of make that switch and just – and just, you know, go undefeated like that. And, and the reason I ask is there's a lot of parents wrestling whose kids 
you know, are, are wrestling and they say, Hey Ryan, I've never wrestled before. I listen to your podcast. And they're kind of, you understand like what, what are some of the keys of that to making that switch? And uh, I'm just curious if you think back on your career, what it looked like. Um, you know, growing up, I was always around the sport, you know, again, like I said, with my dad being as close to that wrestling team, um, you know, I was always around it, got to learn from, you know, this was back in the day they used to wrestle on field house and my club kids club was ran by whoever Gable decided on the team to go coach that night. So it might be Lisa <laughs> Ciparelli, it might be Barry Davis. And so, you know, I, I, I went to the club there. Um, I had zero attention span and then never got diagnosed with ADHD because it probably wasn't a thing back then, um, but would have had it. Um, for sure. And so did that, you know, wrestled maybe 20, 30 matches, you know, a summer, but I played Babe Ruth and I did football. You know, I played, I played tennis and football all the way through my sophomore year in high school um, and baseball, my freshman year as well. I was, wasn't good at any of the other ones just so happened to wrestling. That was my thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I won one AU title, I think my fifth or sixth grade year at 95. Um, and then, you know, I, I'd always won, a lot of tournaments but there was always kids that there's three or four kids that come to mind that always had these mind blocks against uh, Flynn from Council Bluffs area Corey Kemmer from Pleasant Valley and um, started working with different coaches worked with Tom Lepic uh, my seventh and eighth grade year um, you know he's Tom Lepic is actually the one who fundraised his name is on the big game wrestling facility um, and worked with him and my break I would say my breakout was my eighth grade year um, I won Northern Place Regionals. This was back when the regional tournaments were really big deals. And yeah. So I wrestled um, Aaron Soraki, um, who Bracco was guy. Bracco yeah. World Team member, uh, Chad Kraft from Minnesota, and then um, Kemmer from Pleasant Valley. And so I won that, and that was kind of like my first big tournament I was involved in and won. Never left the state until that, that until my eighth grade. I mean, I, I might have wrestled in Illinois once or twice at a small tournament in Genesis. Tennessee or something definitely Tulsa dual Tulsa nationals didn't exist none of the big you know super 32s none of that was around um if I wrestled um 40 matches my sixth grade year that might be a lot didn't wrestle freestyle until my seventh or eighth grade year and that was so I won regionals my eighth grade year and then started working with Keith Moreland and Keith Moreland from from a from a technical development standpoint um, I've not been exposed to another coach that has his level of understanding for fine level detail technique and started, started with him as a, as a private coach. And then he added two or three and he started a club basically. It started with me and then Don Taraski's and a few of the other kids from the area where technique drilling, a lot of drilling, you know, whereas like Perler is so focused on drilling. We were kind of that way then as well. Yeah. Um, and then live wrestling and then it grew into the Hawkeye wrestling club. And then when he left to go to Virginia tech, um, Pablo Ubasa, basically took over that club and so boss's club was what keith moreland's club was before that interesting so is keith moreland have anything to do with why tom brands went to virginia tech i don't know any I relation there think, just no i don't think so i mean because he was out i can't remember how long keith was out there when i was in college um so my, after my sophomore year i we went and did joe Wims, uh daryl weber um uh, Corey Christensen, myself, we took my parents' van. We did a trip. We did Virginia Tech camp, and then we went to Hofstra and did a camp for Tom Ryan. Wow. And, and so I can't remember how long Keith was out there for. And then, um, yeah. Wow. That's, uh, I mean, just to summarize, though, you were exposed to a lot of big matches, and mm -hmm. you saw the how awesome wrestling could be at Carver at the Nationals, and then you're know, a great coach that that really honed your skill. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm going to have to wrap it up. But uh, I just want to ask, you know, Simpson, you're at, uh, in 2020, uh, 2020, yeah, 2020, you joined the Simpson staff. You were named the head of women's coach this year. I did not realize Dylan Peters is out there, which is awesome. He was such a legend, uh, you know, right when I got into coaching. So awesome to see him, him still involved. Talk to us about your journey to Simpson. Um, I, I it's, it's weird because I, I, I'd been involved with coaching my entire life, you know, mostly in the club scene. So when I was in um, Naperville, um, the probably the very first super club that ever was in existence, overtime wrestling. Sean Borme started that, right? Love it. So I was living in Naperville, helping out there when I could. I was doing private coaching. I helped uh, coach Alex Sertzis, um his senior year. Um, he was coming from Indiana. So Jimmy was, he'd been recruited by Jimmy. He knew I was living there. So we would find high school gyms and he'd come up from Indiana. We'd work out, do some private training, move back um, to Iowa City, um, help with Mark Ryland and their club, you know, so Kofi's and Moore's and Hathaway's and all those guys was really involved in their club, moved to Des Moines, just started getting involved with Waukee and then Seabolt and then a bunch of other clubs. And 
you know, I just saw one day um, popped up on my news feed that Simpson was looking for a coach and asked my wife if it was okay. And she said, well, I, I always assumed that this was going to be the path. Um, just didn't realize it was going to take this long, right? That you're, you know, in your forties and all of a sudden now you're going to go do the career that we always assumed you were going to do. The good, <laughs> the good part about it is I don't have the same wear and tear on my body as some of these, some of these coaches do that they've been doing it for so long. Um, but was down there for a couple of years, worked with the athletic administration. Um, we took the better part of two years to form a business plan, work with Terry Steiner, work with Mike Moyer to, to not just, Hey, snap our fingers and add a women's program. Like some programs might be doing. We did it the right way, added the women's program. Um, we got a new facility coming this year. That's going to be over four and a half mats. Um, wow. you know, just, just, just a lot of good things going on down there. And then with the growth that we have um, in the state of Iowa and throughout the country, it's, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to building an amazing culture down there. Um, you know, our, our, our focus is, you know, quality over quantity, you know, some of these teams, both on the men's side and women's side, whether it's NAI or division three that are, you know, 40, 50 girls or 40, 50 guys on the team, that's not our focus. You know, we want to get to a meaningful, um, happy medium, uh, where we have some great competition, but, um, culture is a big thing for us, uh, both on the men's and women's side and then the academic side as well. I think the average, I think the GPA of the 10 girls I have coming in this year is like average is like a 3.7. Right. And so, wow. um, you know, more of the same for us, it makes it easy for recruiting, even though we're division three, um, because they had give out academic awards, um, that helps out a lot. It was like, Oh, yeah. division three, how do you recruit without scholarships? I'm like, we don't have athletic scholarships, but when we recruit top tier student athletes, um, it's not a challenge for us. Right. No, and I've I've been uh, on this podcast at length talking about how much I appreciate Division Three and my brother wrestled at Co. And I just love the man, such a such a cool thing to go see the cultures of those program and go to the D three nationals. And you know, like you said, man, I used to coach a little bit, and you, know, the amount of kids that would want to go to a D one school because yeah, it's sexy, it's awesome. Who wouldn't? And they, but then they never wrestle, or they they lose the they lose the passion and. Uh, you know, a lot of those guys would be served well to look at a D2 or a D3. You know, I think it's it's just a really, really great part of wrestling. Yeah, and I mean, we, we've gotten a few transfers from – so we have a D1 transfer on the men's side that's going to be on our team this year. Um, we had a transfer uh, two years ago from Warburg who, you know, did very well for us. And so, you know, we're just, we're just growing the team in the right way. Um, as you mentioned, Coach Peters, you know, his background, he's – he's salt of the earth, right? He's a hard worker. He lives life, right? He still scrap. He still can scrap every single day with oh, this I guy. Can't even, I don't you know, doubt he's that big one in bitch. the, he's big in the, I want to get him in like street leagues or something like that, but under no circumstances yes! would he do it? He would take, he would tear some dudes up. Oh like, my God. I think he still has like five, four or 5% body fat. So he wants to do like the Everest challenge that they have up at um, you and I, we're moving into a new gym that has really high ceilings. And so he wants to do that. And he's like, you're going to do it with me. I'm like, I will cheer you on. There's no way I'm doing it, right? Wow. But he, want, he thinks he can break the record. And I think he can. Because I think Kyle Biscoglia did it in like 10 days. Um, Wait, what is this? This so challenge? You and, I, you and I does an Everest challenge. I think what Everest is like 29,000 something feet, right? And so they have a rope there. And what, however many rope climbs to climb to Everest. How many, how many, how, how fast can you, how fast. And I think Biscoglia, uh, I can't remember who had it before, Biscoglia. But he did it in 10 days, which was like a hundred and some rope climbs a day for 10 days straight. Oh my God. Like, what a sinister only, thing. Yeah. Not just the physical aspect of it, but your hands are getting tear up. And there's rules. You can't like tape, pre-tape. If your hands have blisters, you can tape the blister, but you can't. They have set rules there for it. And so uh, you know, Dylan being a U and I guy and being a lot like Doug Schwab, and he's like, We should do this. I'm like, when you say we, you mean you and the guys in the team, right? <laughs> not me. Yeah, no, I mean Dylan Peters back in the day, my God, K was just a a brick shit house, just would absolutely still is. murder still people. Is. Oh my he's, God, he's, he still is and still does. He, you know, there's guys in the team that are dumbfounded by how strong and how smooth he is and how he gets to positions. You know, he's got he has definitive limits of like weight classes that he won't go above, um, because you know he's he's not a big guy. I mean, if he weighs one forty five, I'd be surprised because he just lives a great lifestyle. Yeah. No, he was a, an absolute hammer. I love what you're thinking on Street League. That's fantastic that you're already going there. Stalemates, we love you. Let's make it happen. Like you said, though, Coach Peters has declined, unfortunately. Maybe we can convince him. Um, well, man, this has been so fun to get on here and, and talk a little wrestling with you. You know, it's it's a little bit of a lull in the wrestling season. You know, Fargo just happened. We got the Worlds coming up. But, 
you know, football starting up, which means wrestling will be uh, coming up right after it. And certainly hope to see you throughout the season. Any last words, coach, before we sign off here? I just appreciate getting the chance to come on and talk and you know, hopefully we get to see each other again sometime soon. Absolutely. Jeff McGinnis, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you.